Well, hello, folks, and welcome to the Dieter Melhorn Fishing Podcast. If you're listening to the podcast on one of the popular podcast platforms out there, thank you for stopping by to listen. If you're a regular listener, I appreciate you coming back. And if you're new, considering uh, downloading the podcast and listening to it. Now, some of y'all will be watching me on YouTube. I do a video podcast version of these podcasts now on my YouTube channel, Dieter Melhorn Fishing. Uh, If you're just listening to the podcast and you want to watch it, uh, I'm doing a little deal now where I actually stream a video version of these podcasts. So uh, be sure to check that out on my YouTube channel, Dieter Melhorn Fishing. Uh, Those of you watching, hello, welcome back. If you're subscribers to the YouTube channel, appreciate you checking it out. Now, no matter where you're at, where you're listening or watching, uh, if you're confused on where to go, uh, just go to my website, DieterMelhornFishing.com, and uh, you can get links to the podcast, the YouTube channel, and there's even contact information for me on there. If you want to leave a comment, give me some feedback, which I love hearing. Uh, I know the uh, YouTube has my comments turned off because of something weird they've been doing. Uh, and leaving comments on podcasts is tough. So, uh, going to my website is the easiest way to do it. And you give me feedback there. And people ask about guide trips. Yes. Doing, uh, the guided fishing trips on area lakes, go to my website. There's links to all that there. So, uh, but yeah, I've, uh, got a guest today. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. I think you'll be interested in hearing their story. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to put these out, um, with some guests here and there. I'm still going to do some solo stuff with just some talking about some topics, maybe some gear reviews, that kind of stuff that I'm going to do on the video podcast. Uh, but I uh, really like doing the interviews with the guests. I just came back from Catapalooza uh, Fishing Expo, which was out in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. A great, great location for a fishing show, folks. Um, This year, they were a little bit behind the eight ball because of COVID. They didn't get permission to actually have the event until late. It messed up some of the marketing. I did not even know if I was going um, because we just didn't know what was happening. COVID was kind of uh, kind of messing with things, you know. Stuff was starting to go back to normal. Tennessee was kind of ahead of the game a little bit, and they were state that said, yes, you can come have your convention and enjoy it. And uh, the venue is awesome. It is amazing. A new modern place. Uh, There are places to sit down. There's actually a lobby area that you come into. Nice carpeted new modern building. Uh, for the ladies, clean bathrooms. Uh, unlike uh, the uh, some other places out there, uh, convention centers and some of these arenas, this is actually a nice place. So, uh, looking forward to it next year. They've committed to the second week in June. You'll be hearing more from me about that as that comes closer. But while I was there, I got to tape a lot of podcasts and record a lot of content that you'll be seeing throughout the year. Uh, both on my YouTube channel and also here on the podcast. And the guest that we've got today is one of those that are recorded out there. And his name is Caleb Page. Some of y'all may have heard of him. He is the co-founder of Catch the Fever. They make the big cat fever rods, the striper stealth rods. Uh, We're really one of the first big, widely known, uh, non-major, you know, corporation-owned catfish rods that kind of came onto the scene with a vengeance a few years ago. And uh, they make several different rods now. The most recent that they've come out with is the Hellcat. Um, And Caleb was gracious enough to sit down with me and tape a podcast. And I'm going to be honest, folks. um, He gave up a lot of good background information and a lot of good stuff about his story, and I really want to thank him. Uh, this guy, after you watch this podcast or listen to it, you're going to have a better understanding about him and what he has done and what he's created at a very young age. Uh, he's, uh, I think this podcast really will open some people's eyes as to exactly how committed he is to the catfish industry 
and to creating a quality product for people out there. Uh, thoroughly impressed after the podcast, after talking to him. And um, when you find out how old he is, uh, some of you younger folks can go, wow, I can do something like that. Uh, some of us older folks may be looking at him and going, what did we do wrong in life? Because he's really kicked butt uh, at, at, the, at the point that he's at. And there's going to be a lot more from him. So uh, take a listen to this podcast. I, I think it's really going to endear Caleb and the brand to you, no matter what rods you fish with. Uh, I, I think he's a good example of what we need in the fishing industry, especially in the catfish industry. Uh, I think he's going to be a leader down the road uh, with the, within the industry with this brand and very, very happy to have him sit down. So let's go have a chat with Caleb Page from Catch the Fever. What is your background? Where are you from? Where, where, did, where did little Caleb come from? So I am from Roxburgh, North Carolina, uh, which is a small town uh, in Person County, uh, right outside of Raleigh-Durham. Um, my background, uh, I, I really, I didn't know what I wanted to do in life. I knew that uh, I, I didn't really want to go to college. College really wasn't for me. Um, so I had to pick something, you know, my parents, they said, you know, you need to get into something, something reliable and uh, ended up getting a job with uh, a good company, Price of Scientific Services, and I did cryogenic refrigeration when I was 19, uh, basically rebuilding chambers that get anywhere between minus 80 to minus 200. Um, that was a good job. It was a good job. I stayed with that company for 10 years. And uh, during that time, uh, being that I had a good job, uh, I matured quickly and uh, was able to move out and, and kind of do my own thing and and it allowed me to be able to go fishing. So uh, now, cryogenics, okay. Yeah. You put on your resume that I used to have a really cool cryogenic. People think I'm a scientist. <laughs> they think I'm a scientist. Yep. Yeah, that's the most off the wall like. It's thing so bizarre. Into. Yeah, because they freeze stem cell uh, stem cells and. Uh, they were messing with uh, growing uh, new humans out of spinal cords and stuff, and we'd be working on these chambers while they're sitting over there in their clean room through the glass doing that type of stuff. It's pretty wild. Wow, pretty that is, that's a whole different it's, world it's crazy of stuff to get than where into. I'm at right now. Now, before that, let's, okay, let's go back to little, back. to little, let's go back oh, to man. little Caleb. First memory of fishing. First memory of Digging, fishing. Yeah, your first memory of actually going fishing. Doesn't have to be catfish, but just No, fish. first memory of actually going fishing, I remember going to the beach and seeing my papa catch a, uh, a big drum right there on the beach. And uh, that just... Big red drum? Yeah. I, I got I got my butt tore up a couple times that day because I kept taking him out of the cooler and they were like you can't take him out of the cooler you got to leave him where he's at kept wanting to drag him out drag him out play with him but uh, yeah that was I can I can define that as like that was when I was like man I want to see what else comes out of that water and uh, I'd go out there sit all day and wait for my dad or my papa to catch a another fish so I can take it off the hook found out that bluefish had teeth that way and uh, got my fingers caught in one of them's mouth one time, so, but fishing on the beach. It's funny how y you described what was a defining moment, mm -hmm. you know. I remember my defining moment for hunting. My brother came, I was eight or nine years old. Brother came in, they brought in some deer. And yeah. it was like this is imprinted in my head, that yeah. whole thing around it, and it like, do you think it ignites something primal in you that it creates that connection? It does, it does. It's funny, like the moments that you, you, we all have a lot of good moments fishing, but there's certain things at certain times that it just sticks and you remember it and you're really young and can't remember anything else, but you remember that. Yeah. And uh, that for me, for sure. Yeah, that's cool. Now, yeah, the, when did you get, I mean, did, was your family in the fishing a yeah, lot? And stuff yeah, like? if you go back in pictures of me and my dad, you know, growing up, we always took a week off, went to C&T Cooper. Um, my dad had a little, 17 foot bass tracker boat and the only thing he cared about was striper fishing and catfishing so we'd go out on santee and you know catfish striper fish and we'd book guides out there we did that growing up and uh so you know dad was always big into catfishing he grew up in south carolina so 
catfishing was where it started. Yeah. So your ties to catfishing go back a while. Oh yeah, all the way to when before I was born. You know, so my daddy and his daddy they made plans to go catfishing all the time. Yeah. So it's it's in the DNA. It's in, it's, it's embedded. Yeah. So you know, you, you said you didn't know if you want to go to college. A lot of yeah. us kind of, and you know, I, I forced myself to go and ended up going taking a right turn with what <laughs> right. I did in life or what I went to school for. Uh, and then you decide you're going to freeze stem cells. And where did the, this idea for a rod company come from? So I, I had just gotten married. I was 21. I was working for Prices. And uh, Dad said, for your, uh, your wedding gift, I'm going to take you on the James River. He said, uh, we're going to, we'd always went catfish, but actually trophy catfishing, that was something that was new. Um, now, so what year was this? This was, oh gosh. Uh, so this was 10 years ago. So this was probably 2000, 2011. Okay. It was right around 2011. And um, we went to the James River and we booked a guide and I caught a 30 pound catfish. And that was the biggest one I'd ever caught. Um, and I was just, it's something at that moment, night fishing, it just flipped the switch. I mean, it, it did. Um, I went back home, just started doing research. I mean, I used to joke and say, you know, just Google anything catfish and read me the first few sentences in the article and I can finish the whole paragraph. It just, at work on my lunch break, I was on the forums, I was, you know, I just was getting in trouble at work a lot because I just was obsessing with catfishing and learning about these big species. And then that turned over into, after I felt I'd learned everything about bait patterns and, and the species itself, I started looking into gear. That's when I realized there's only a couple companies that's got product for catfish. Now, the, 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 stop <coughs> you there. Mm -hmm. Confession time. Yep. What rods were you fishing with back then? Ugly stick catfish rods, eight foot two pieces. One of the few rods that actually had a catfish and the name exactly. catfish on it. Exactly. Exactly. Plus, I was twenty one, so I was broke as a joke. So I mean, I just, you know, I just, I, I just, I didn't have a lot of money to put in a good setup. I mean, especially you know what we're producing now. There's no way, you know, I could have. Um, and but. Those rods worked well, so regardless, you know, they, they seemed to work well. But when I started learning about the, the gear and, you know, the guides and the number of guides and guide placement and two-piece versus one-piece and, you know, stuff like that, I was like, huh, you know, there's only like two companies on the scene that's producing something like this, tried it. But for North Carolina, you know, shallow water fishing, then going to the James Castle, it just, the tips were either too stiff or the rods were too limber. You know, I felt that when I went to the James River, my ugly sticks were not enough. And then when I come back to Kerr Lake, they were a lot of fun catching fish on, but when I catch a 50 pounder, you know, I didn't feel like I had the control in the shallow water when they dive in the boat. So then that's when it started buying these rods and I was like, there's nothing out there yet. That to me was the perfect catfish rod, Yeah. you know. So that's when uh, a good friend of mine, Tony Caton, uh, he had contacted me. I was fishing tournaments at this time. I was, and he said, hey, man, I want to get up and go catfishing with you. So we went catfishing, and we started fishing some tournaments and stuff together. And and I remember telling him, I was like, man, if we, if we had a rod that was like this, you know, I'd, I'd watched all these videos. I'd watch rod building videos. You know, like, if, if there was a catfish rod that was like this, man, it'd be, be a million-dollar idea, I'm telling you. I mean, you could take it to here. You could take it there, there, there. We wouldn't have to have all these rods. And he was like, man, that's, I think this is going to be a good idea. And uh, he had some connections with overseas and got us hooked up with a, a manufacturer and started. Now, just a, a little backstory with him. He, he had familiar, familiarity with the way things had, are done when you outsource to another right. country and all yep, that, he had which some, is a big, yeah, that's that's a big step. That's a big step. That's a big step. So, you know, Neither one of us had come from the fishing scene. So, you know, he had a contact that might know somebody that's over there. And then, but there's that starting point that's led us to where it's at now, which we use totally different manufacturers now than when we did when we started. But um, it was getting that start with somebody who will design us a rod 
like what I was talking about. And uh, went back and forth with about 14 different blanks, modifying this, changing that, to where we had the big cat fever, medium heavy. Now let's go, I want to get back to that whole process. Yeah. And what you were saying in the beginning there yep. is, is we all got good ideas. Uh -huh. you know? I mean, everybody's got an idea for something. Yeah, you know, that thing you I hear would, it all the time. What you said a minute ago, I, I can make a million dollars off it's this. A million dollar idea. Yeah, it, it's making, bridging that distance to where you put an order in for these things to come to. Yep. How scary was that in, 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 before you even put in the order and send the money to do it and, and finding somebody you can trust? Because you're dealing with people, yeah. a lot of times you don't even see them. Right, absolutely. What's that like? Putting in an order for that, it was terrifying. I remember, so our families had to kick out some money to help get the first order in, I figured our first order was like 100 rods, yeah. you know, but again, you know, my wife was in school. I was the only one working, you know, so didn't have tons of money laying around. So I remember sitting down at the table and it was like, okay, this is the money. We can buy 100 rods. And I remember stopping to myself and like losing that, zoning out of the conversation and thinking to myself, what if you don't know what you're talking about? What if you are 100% wrong? Like it become surreal. It's almost like if you give me 20,000, I could make you 30 and then somebody gives it to you and then you're like, oh, now I gotta do it. It was scary to think like, what if this is a failure? What if I'm not right on this? Even though I did my homework, I felt confident, you know, what if with this is right, but we did it. Mm -hmm. So we- uh, Now a hundred rods, okay. Now yeah. looking back on that now, you probably laugh at yourself. Like, yeah. A yeah, hundred rods. Yeah. but. At the time, I mean, were you sitting deal. there thinking, what, what am I going to do if I got 50 rods sitting in the closet or 100, 200 rods? What am I, what am I going to do with them? That was a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Zach Royce, he saw it. He came there when the first shipment arrived and, uh, you know, he came and picked out, you know, six of them. He was like our first pro staffer and uh, he saw it. It was 100 rods laying there and I didn't know if we were going to sell them or if uh, I felt... The first article I wrote is, why is Big Cat Fever Rods different? I remember that night when we got them, I said, you know what? And this is what I've always said. People are like, man, you're a good, you're a salesman. I, I don't, I'm not trying to sell you anything. I just talk about what I know. Mm -hmm. And if I talk about what I know, can't nobody change that. I don't have to remember the same thing. I remember going home and just thinking, you know what? We don't have any ad money. We don't have any of this. I'm just going to write why these rods are what they are. And here's, like I told you, going to the James River, it was not enough rod. When you come in on the Kerr Lake, it, 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 was, it, it, was, it was, some of them were too stiff. Just laid it out there. People read that, it got a ton of shares, it got like 140 shares, and we started selling those rods. So just explaining what the product does, and it was easy back then because, you know, there wasn't a ton of competitors out there you know we were solving a problem who was on the scene outside of shakespeare yeah, the big names it was, who, who, were there any of the other yep. catfish rods out there then so and if somebody was on the scene before naming these people i do apologize no, i just no, no, i just no. hadn't heard yeah. um but it was tangling with catfish rods um jerry klein jerry klein's a great guy tangling with catfish is very well respected they've got some of the most respected people in catfishing on their team um, and then also bottom dwellers takedown rods. It's interesting because we all have our version of the perfect catfish rod. Jerry Klein's rod uh, works great in a lot of places, just about everywhere in the United States, just like a big cat fever rod. But there was differences that I would have liked to have seen a little bit more in that rod. And uh, then, you know, uh, bottom dwellers, they were super popular rod. That's just what we all use. Killer James River rod. But when I got home on Kerr Lake and I'm catching these eight, 10 pounders, you know, I just wanted something that was going to really load up. I love that horseshoe effect when a fish is beside the boat. I like feeling every little fight in that rod bending. But those were the two companies that really still to this day hold a good name and a staple in the industry that were on the scene before I came about. Mm -hmm. I know Whisker Seeker, I think, was on there as well, but I'm talking about just two companies that really everybody knew made a catfish rod designed for that and they'd been around. Yeah. Those are the two staples. I always wanted to ask you this. Mm -hmm. The name, Catch the Fever. 
Mm-hmm. Looking back on it, do you ever wish you would have come up with a one word name? Yes. I've That's, always wondered that. I've it always can wondered. be difficult. It can you be difficult. You can't unring that bell now, though. No, you can't. It, but now, I don't, I, looking back to see what it is, because it ties in with that fever, that obsession. I remember, like, when I went on the James River and caught that 30 pounder, it became like a fever. It was an obsession. It just, and still to this day, it's, it's all you think about. And then when you talk to other anglers, it's all they think about. And it just, I mean, it causes problems at work. It causes problems in your relationship. It is a fever. Yeah. And uh, right now it's very highly searched because of COVID. Thank you, COVID. Yeah. You know, catch the fever is number one because of that. So so you have capitalized <laughs> on COVID indirectly without planning. That's Everybody amazing. Everybody's got a fever, so we're getting searched like crazy. You didn't crazy. think about that. Yeah, That man. is funny. We're rolling. That is funny. We're rolling on the Google search. What made me think about that with the name again, I thought about it in the beginning. I was like, man, that's just it's kind of a pain in the butt yeah. and then when he came out with the hellcat rod yep and i saw that and i was like i know good and well he's sitting there thinking I wish it'd be so much the easier the brand yeah it would be a hook know. h-u-k yeah boom one put it on a hat everything when you go into multiple names uh multiple words it you have to place it on shirts differently then you start looking at you know you got to have a logo so you can make it smaller but recognizable but uh yeah, I mean, catch the fever. It'd be nice if it was just hook or something like that, but we made it work. So, and that brings me back to this. In you know the marketing world and building a brand, they would tell you to do something different. But you kind of went into it innocently. Do you think that yeah. innocence kind of helped you in doing this? I think so. Yeah, I, I think so. It, it was. I mean, we still find out things to this day that's like, man. I wish I'd known that from the beginning, but you just make adjustments and you make the adjustments that you need to continue to, to grow in the industry. Um, I think there's still a lot of things that we do probably now um, that people that's been in this industry and have built companies, sold companies, who probably look at us and think, he don't realize he's gonna have to do this differently, this differently, but I'll get there, I'll find out what I need to do and I'll do it, you know. What have you learned that's kind of surprised you? I know I, in, the YouTube world, there's stuff that I picked up on that, you know, it was like, crap, I didn't even think about that in the beginning. What, what, looking back, what's something that you've come across that you've just said, wow, I never thought of, and everything I did, you know, I'm thinking about rods, everything else. Is it, is it order fulfillment? You know, getting, you know, I hear that from a lot of people with orders, you know, dealing yeah. with getting stuff from overseas. It's a whole different thing than going to get a loaf of bread down at the grocery store. Yes, sir. It is. It is. I think the biggest thing that I have, I've, that really just caught me by surprise, and um, I've called my old boss man before, and, and, or when I've seen him, and just said, I just want to tell you thank you. Yeah. I, 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 I don't appreciate you, I didn't appreciate you enough for what, you know, I used to think, you know, a hunt, uh, you know, X amount of dollars was a lot of dollars, but it's not in business. You know, that's that's what surprises me. You know, is is how much it takes when you're dealing with overseas that you've got to buy and put out and wait for product to come in. And then now, Catch Fever, we employ seven of us now. And then you got payroll coming out in that meantime. The surprising thing to me is just the business side of it. Um, it's very maturing when you have to get into the overhead side of it. You know, when you start out as a rod brand and I might be, you know, letting in on people that are thinking about coming in or coming in, it's it's not hard in the beginning. Um, but as you grow, you know, in the beginning, you feel a sense of cockiness. You feel like, man, you know, because it's a new product, it's a new industry. And I'm telling you how I felt, you know, not talking how my competitors are, but how I felt. You're confident, not really cocky, but you're, you're confident in it. And then the overhead side of it, and then growing your business, finding out what you need to do to get to that next step, next step. It's a very humbling side of it, and you appreciate, you start to appreciate your customers more. And uh, you start to appreciate every rod a lot more, you know, instead of, yeah, you need 10 rods, you take 10 rods, you need two rods, you take two rods. Yeah. You start to really, but the biggest thing that surprised me is the business side of it. What it takes to stay in business and what it takes after work 
to plan for the next thing to outdo the next person to stay in business next year. Yeah. That's what surprised me. That matured me a lot, you know, is, is realizing that and that you got to make sure that happens. There's no option. How, and you talk about that thinking of the next thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of opportunities for you, but I would think with every opportunity, there's a big financial investment to go in that direction. Yeah. You want to do crappy rods? We'll do crappy. You're going to do stri yeah. you do on striper rods. You're going yeah. to stripers, salt water. You know, there's a whole different direction there. Is that something that you're thinking about strategically, or are you kind of seeing how things go? Or I would the... love to sit here and make everybody think that we have a panel of about 12 people that I pitch an idea out to, and they're like, "Yeah, we can have to. So we'll allocate half a million dollars for that." Yeah. Yep, that's not what happens. It's mostly opportunity as it comes and where we are at as a brand um, where I make a decision on something like that. Uh, Zach called me up out of the blue you know, a year or two ago and said, look, man, I really feel like I, I'd like to design a trolling rod, um, one that you get hung up less. And I told him, I said, tell me what the problems you're solving with getting hung up less. You, and I need more than just getting hung up less. And he went into a 30 minute ordeal. Mm -hmm. And I listened to him at the end of that conversation, I said, I would buy that rod. You just solved like three different things for me. I would buy that rod, let's do it. And we got started because I, I knew if, if I always say, I am, I am my customer. I am my, if I will buy it, a lot of times my customer will buy it. I'm not saying I'm the, what I like is what the majority are like, but we're not dealing with clothes. You know, somebody, I like these pants and a lot of guys may not like these pants, but in a catfishing rod, if it solves my needs as a catfisherman, it solves everybody else's needs as a catfisherman, you know, as well. Problems are problems and if we're solving them, we're solving them. And that's kind of how it happens. And I have noticed with every market I get into, we got into the catfish rods, the striper guys called us said, hey, look, man, you know, we've been trying to get these big manufacturers to design a striper rod for like this and this price point, and they won't. How, and then we start to look in, how many retailers are carrying striper rods? How many, how big is the market? And me, I don't need a huge market. Um, the biggest question I get asked was, if it's such a good idea, why hadn't other people done it yet? And I, what I live off of is the crumbs, you know, to me, a million dollars is a million dollars to some of these bigger companies. They're like, dude, right. we're not a million right. bucks. No, we're $30 million a year. We're not going to go after a million dollar market. I'll go for a million dollar market. Yeah. I will. I will. Let it be a niche. That's fine because I know when I step into that million dollar market, there's going to be an opportunity somewhere. There's going to be some angler who's the smartest man in the room who used that product, who picks up my phone and it's like, hey, I'm world-class musky fisherman. I saw what you did here. I was with this guide. I've been trying to get these big brands over here to design a rod for what I do. Do you think you could help me? I look into them, and next thing we know, we're off into the musky market. So I get into things for the opportunity. Yeah. Now let me ask you. You seem very business savvy, mm -hmm. and this is something that you know I haven't. I know you are from the way you operate, but. Where did you get that from? You didn't go to school for I that? I am not Is the smartest man in the room. Thing? No. Uh, or, uh, or where did that come from? My mother cleaned houses, and she did very well at that. She retired after 30 years. My dad uh, worked in the tobacco industry, um, and the rest of my family, a lot of them cut hair. Mm -hmm. And um, But for me, it's been the pressure of you got you got to figure it out is what it, so I rely on podcasts a lot with, a lot of people, I have noticed what, what separates a lot of people is what they do in their free time. There are people when they ride in a car for 10, 12 hours, they listen to their country music or they'll listen to a, 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 a you know, a, some other music. Then there's people that are listening to Gary Vee. There's people that are listening to other podcasts, people that will transform your mind in your way of thinking. That's what separates a lot of people is it's our way of thinking. You got these people, you, they, you know, they get some a hundred bucks and they're going to do this with it. You got these people that get a hundred bucks, they do this with it. And to get that mindset, it's who you're rubbing elbows with. And in a little town of Roxborough, there's not a lot of people to rub your elbows with. So you have to look other sources for people to open your mind up 
and put that in there. A lot of that is where you get it from. I mean, you're, you're looking, I'll, I'll get, I've got inspiration that I've shared to our video guy from a toothpaste commercial. There's just that moment where they did something cool where you're like, man, you could tie that into fishing. It's just being aware and, you know, working with people that, I mean, listening to podcasts and stuff like that, successful people. All right, six hour drive back to Roxboro. Yep. You've answered all your calls and, and you've answered all your emails. You're going to listen to the podcast. I like Gary V. Yeah. Gary v. A lot of times if somebody's with me, I won't. Yeah. You know, because not. Because he cusses. He drops yeah, the F-bomb he does. a lot. Yeah. He yeah. does. And, you know, that's why I always say, you know, when people are doing videos, entertaining is expensive, educational is cheap. You know, if you're going to entertain like Duck Dynasty, you got to spend a big production on making people laugh. It costs a lot of money because it's got to be clear. Education, you can have a flip phone. And if you're going to go film the guy out there who knows how to catch 60 pounders every time he goes out and you're going to film it on a flip phone, I don't care if it's in black and white. I just want to know how he does it. Gary V to me is that. He's raw. He's, he's, it's, it's not really well put together on a lot of things, but I'm after that information. I'm after that one piece of information that's going to transform my mind into something else. And then he's interviewed other people that have podcasts that you go off and you watch those as well. And you may have to go f a while listening to things before you get that one piece of information that transforms your thinking. I just want to transform my thinking. That's all I want. Does your mind ever turn off to this business? It do doesn't. You? I'm on some really good medication now that helps it. <laughs> um, that has actually been really good, but uh, that's kind of made me relax. A lot more. So you're serious? You actually, yes, you sir. got something like a, yeah. some, you know, that, that, to that mellow actually... me out. Yeah. Awesome. You got so much stuff that you're thinking about. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a million things going on and, and, you know, it's, you got to have something to kind of help you turn it off because it, it won't turn off once has you get been, started. Has there been a bad side to that? Because that, that oh, kind of, absolutely. You, being consumed by something absolutely. is great as that is, it gives absolutely. you a passion, but yep. it has. Everything a, comes with a cost. Yeah. That's the thing. I think a lot of people see the brand and it's done well and they're like, you know, everybody's an overnight success when it's, it starts doing well. That's what overnight everybody Overnight success that took a de decade yeah. to get there. Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest, it's, it's costed, you know, I me mean, uh, social life, you know. I, I can't tell how many people have said, you know, I can't get a hold of you or, or you know, used to hang out. We can't hang out anymore. Um, relationships, it's costed relationships. Um, there is a sacrifice to going after and pursuing to, to, do the, to do your best work at one thing. It is, it's a sacrifice and, you know, You've got to make up your mind if, if balance, if you can get balance. If you're the type that's going after balance, then you've got to deal with a guy like me who says there is no balance and I'm just coming after that. But not to say I'm doing the right thing and not to say that they're doing the right thing. It's just, I don't have balance. So I'm always after what's next yeah. going for it. But I also recognize at the end of the day that you know, business and, and what I've realized is catfishing and fishing rods, you know, it, that's not what it's life's about at the end of the day. But I'm at the point where right now it's got to work. It's got to work. We got people, you know, Ashley, my brand operations manager, you know, when she gets a new car, buys a brand new car, that comes back on you. You feel like, I just bought a new car, too, because she relies on me. Do you remember the moment that hit? Because that is something for people who don't own a business. Yeah. They never realize that, and it never hits them. Yeah. But when you have somebody working for you, yeah. especially an employee, it's one thing with contractors, they yeah. work with everybody. But when you have an employee that is on payroll, do you remember that first moment, and it resonates with everybody, where you go, holy crap, I, I this isn't just about me mm -hmm. it's about somebody else oh yeah yeah it's that goes back to that maturing feeling as your business grows and you you've actually got people where you walk in the office and i do this often where I, when we've got everybody there and everybody's working like i just kind of will look around we got alexis our new hire over there she quit her job to come work for there and then ashley and then you got charlie you got Brandon, John, Graham, all of them like that works for us. And I'll sit there and I'll think, what am I doing? 
like I am the least smartest man in the world. Like out of an entire catfish, out of my entire town, I am the least smartest guy. But it's it's not it's it's about how bad you want it. But still, it's it's humbling and it's scary sometimes because it's like. But then you remember, you're here for a reason. I've got people that work for me that's graduated, and uh, John Deuce, if go on record and say it, he's gonna watch this. He's in school for rocket science. Our IT guy, he's in school for rocket science right now. So it's not about having that education that makes that false sense of security. It's about you're there for a reason, you've gotten this far, just keep doing what you're doing. When did it get serious? Okay, you order 100 rods, okay, that's a big deal. It's got, yeah. you got some money tied up in yeah. it. Nobody's job's on the line. Yeah. You probably could have went back to freezing embryos sure. or something. Yeah. You still got bailout time at that yeah. point. When was the turning point of, holy crap, this is serious? When you order three times more rods than you ever had in the very early beginning, after you sold those 100 and you buy 300, then after the 300, you buy 800 and then somebody catches a state record. That's when it's serious. That's when it's like, oh, snap. Oh boy, you know, this $15,000 and we've been in business for four months. You know, that's when it, I think that's when it first got serious. I mean, when Zach caught that state record, we done in Sunrise for four months. So you just tripled your order and then you got to pay somebody. Yeah. But you know what, it's, it, the, the height, I remember going back to work. I was going back to work and I was just, I was depressed. I was like, man, this is not supposed to happen this soon. You know, and my boss, Tony Price, who is, was great, but he was like, what are you going to do? And I'm like, you ain't going to worry about me going nowhere. I'm going to continue working here for you because I, I ain't going to be going to the fishing side anytime soon. Now, back up and tell this because there are some people who are going to listen to the podcast yeah. that do not know the deal with Catch the Fever. Yeah and catching a state record, That's a world right. record. Explain so, explain how that was then yep. and how that was set up. So how it is then and how it is now is with uh, Catch Fever, our slogan is the brand that pays to fish. If you catch a state record on the eligible species list on our website, you go on catchfever.com, click on payouts. If you catch a particular one of those species on our rod, it's $10,000 payout for using our rod and it's an additional 5,000 if you've got our apparel on in the picture when they come out there to take pictures with it and everything and you, you use our stuff. Um, you get an opportunity to earn 15000 A lot of people say, oh, I won $15,000, and you don't. What it is is you have an opportunity to earn up to $15,000. So you catch that fish, we're going to pay you for an interview. And to tell your story and stuff like that, we're going to pay you for your interview and process like that. But, uh, yep, if you don't have one of our rods and you catch a state record crappy and you've got our hat on, you know, it's five grand yeah. if you're using one of our rods. That's an additional ten. You now, know. were you the only person doing that at the time that came up? Yeah, with this yeah, we we're, were the only gig in town that's doing that. Um, How did that idea? I mean, where did that idea come from? Were y'all just sitting around like drunk one night? No. And all of a sudden, go. Let's just make it fifteen thousand. No. Let's make it a hundred. Oh, five the, a thousand. The fifteen thousand came into it's it's enough money to where it's a lot. It's it's a good amount of money, but it's not enough to get you in trouble. It can still get you in trouble. Um, Four months into a business, it's, is, you're in trouble. Yeah, <laughs> you're in That's, trouble. But um, yeah, so and we don't have insurance. We don't do insurance. You know, a lot of people think we have insurance. And the thing you find when you start looking into insurance is they want you to hold your mouth just right. It's got to be, you know, this type of day on this body of water. But when you're the judge, jury, and executioner, you know, you can set the rules how you want it. So it's not 150000 to where you can bankrupt your company, but it's not 2000 where somebody's like, eh, it ain't worth it. Yeah. It's right in the middle. So <laughs> you, you, you're, you're former. I want to get back to the Zach thing because... Yeah. Um, you're four months into this. Oh gosh. Zach calls. I think I yeah. got a text from him that morning. Yeah. And says, I think I got a state record. State record. I was like, oh my goodness. I was like, are you, are you sure? And he said, yeah, we, we're weighing it now on different scales. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Call Tony. We're calling each other. We're like, oh my goodness. You know, we, we just, we literally, we are just into this. I, I immediately drop everything I'm doing. I ride straight out to Lake Gaston. Lake Gaston's an hour and a half away from me. I go out there. 
I offered my boat with a big live wheel in it and uh, we put it in there. The people show up, we weigh it, sure enough, it's a state record. And I remember thinking to myself like, Lord, I told you if you didn't want me doing this to shut the door and you know, this is, that's right, <laughs> well, that's right. We are men of our word. If we tell you we're gonna get you your money, you're gonna get paid and Zach did. But, you know, and on the back end, on a customer, they look at it like, you know, when you start a business, everybody's got $100,000, and that's not the case. That was, that was all the money we had. This is the first time, really, you know, ever going on record and saying, like, that, was, that was everything. You know, I, I remember us having a team meeting and, and saying, like, you know, look, guys, this is, this is, this is business. You're going to have to pull it. I remember calling my wife, Nikki, at the time. And if she's watching, she'll, she'll remember the call. I said, we've got to pull this amount of mu much of our own personal money to, to do this. And she's like, I'm in school. I'm, in the, I'm like, look, this is going to pan out. This is going to work out. Trust me. Trust Did me. Did you really believe that at the time? <sighs> because that's I, what I would have told mom. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I, I felt like I did, but I was very unsure. It was, yeah. it was very, very nerve-wracking. Yeah. But uh, we did it. You know, we, we pulled it together. We got that next rod order in, and it sold out overnight. Now, for people that don't know this whole story, you fast forward and skip past an interesting 24 hours after he caught the state record. Oh, yeah, let me tell you about that. So we, we get, the, the dust settles. I'm laying in bed at night, can't sleep that night. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to the James River. I'm going to the James River. I'm just going to go fishing. Just, I'm going fishing. I'm, I'm just going fishing. Went to the James River the next day, sitting there, just praying. I'm like, Lord, what, are, what am I doing, man? Like, what am I doing? should I ask my old boss for, you know, for, for some money? I mean, if you're just really unsure, We're, we've never been in business before. We're in business. We got to pay all this money. We just paid for this big rod order at the time we thought was big. And my phone starts ringing like crazy off the hook again. And I'm like, what in the world? So I answer, Zach Zajac. He's like the, one of the Blues Brothers guys. He said, Zach caught state record. I'm like, I know, I know that another person's beeping in, you know, and I'm like, what are you talking about? They're like, no, he caught another state record. I'm like, there's no way this is impossible. <laughs> I'm like, still in North Carolina. <laughs> dude, I was like, this cannot be happening. This cannot be happening. So, all the, the phones just ring. They're like, no, he released the fish. He fished again. He caught another state record. This is crazy. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is wild. Well, I knew that it, we had a gaming attorney put this thing together. I knew there was in there about a time period. But when you're getting so many calls, you just, you don't, you, you, you forget your own rules. And like, I mean, I literally will probably die at 40 because of this day. Yeah. I mean, it just took so many years off my yeah. life. And just to be clear, so people that are listening to this understand it, he, he caught a record, he got it weighed, yep. got it released alive, and then says, oh, I ain't got nothing to do. I'm going to go back fishing. Yep. And then catches one a little bigger. Yes, he does. He and catches it's, another stay right. And he's got it on camera again. Yeah. He's got it. It's all legit. So I call, call my partner, Tony, we call our game attorney and he's like, what's the stress? And I'm like, uh, we're sitting here trying to figure out how we're gonna pay 15,000, now we're gonna pay another 15,000. He said, Caleb, no, it says it's one eligible species a year. And I'm like, oh, that's right. Oh my goodness, like, whoa. And he said, yeah. Like, Yay, yeah, I, I know, excited. I know. <laughs> Cause I was like, man, we're just gonna, you know what, we're just gonna call the company Zach Royce Fishing and we'll work for Zach. Yeah, we'll just tell exactly. them, say, look, we'll just work for you. But, um, but yeah, that's how it ended up working out. Looking back on that, now everything's always, you know, looking yeah. back, it's nice and easy. But I dare say there's not a company out there that wouldn't pay somebody right now $15,000 to get every day of the week. Right. We that's, do it every day of the week. That's the best yep. advertising expense you've ever made, it especially was. on that fish. It is. It Two is. fish, I should say. Two fish. I mean, it's one of those scenarios where when you're in the moment, when you're 40 months in business, there are no safety nets. You're just acting on something that you're hoping is going to work out and something like that comes along that you got to pay out. You feel like the world's coming down on you when actually we were just getting put through the fire to get ready for something that was much bigger. You know, we all like things to happen to us that are good when we're ready for them to happen. But 
that situation really taught me that, you know, no matter what happens, it's preparing you for the next step. Yeah. Yeah. Now, since then, have you had two more? Did the other Yeah, we've two? had um, both the Zach state records caught. Um, uh, Tyler Barnes caught a flathead state record on our ride. Joey Baird's caught uh, a, the North Carolina blue state record. So we've had four state records caught on uh, catch fever rides. We've had Dale's 141 pound and a half short of the world record caught. Um, we've had states from all over be within a half an ounce of their state record catching with catch the fever products. So uh, it's been close, but we've got four titles for that. What's the next evolution for Catch the Fever? Are you, you know, without going to anything proprietary here, but I mean, are, are you looking, you know, down the road? Obviously, I can, your wheels turn. We know that from this, this interview so far. What do you want to be doing? Where do you want to be going? Right what's kind yep. of like, it, what's the, the next right. evolution yeah. for you? That's what's nice about Catch the Fever. You know, you go to your website and everybody will quickly realize what our business model is. You go to Catch Fever and you choose your fever. Big Cat Fever, Striper Fever. You'll be able to choose uh, Crappy Fever. I just got back from Florida from filming up with our inshore rods that we've now completed, you know, inshore fever. Now the website's going to get broke up into two where you got freshwater fever, uh, saltwater fever, and then we'll have rods designed for that. But Catch the Fever does not have any limits. That could be hunting, you know, that could be snowboarding, that could be, you know, I'm just throwing that out right, there, but right. it could be, there's a lot of things that we're all into and we're passionate about that's something that drives our life that we could get into. Mm -hmm. So we could get into anything that we want. For me, I don't want to come out with anything, a bunch of new products. We like to be methodical about what we get into next. You know, even big companies that have billions of dollars like Apple and stuff, they don't come out with 50 different products right out the gate. They come out with one to four things each year and be good at it. So I think for us down the road, we will be getting into other things. That symbol right there, that's fish hooks, could be turned into antlers. And you see us in the hunting industry. It's just right timing for everything, right, right. timing. Obviously, when you come to market, you've come to market with different rods, different areas. Uh, and we don't ever see any of these until they're ready to go. Mm -hmm. Have you got a failure story of something that you've built, tried, that you can tell us about that you just dumped some money into and said, this ain't going to work? Have you had one of those yet? Have you pushed the envelope that far with something? I that haven't. You haven't got I, I, with all the skews that, I mean, I'm talking about that was really a cat like, oh crap, I have not. And I think it's just because I am so nervous about what comes next and I don't operate on a whim. It just sounds like a good idea. This is something we need to do now. This is what's coming. This is what's, this is what's on, you know, everybody gets in your head. You, you got to hit the market now. You got to hit the market now. And then you end up doing something that if you would have just sat back a minute and just kind of combed through it, you would have, everything that we do at first, I, if you pitch it, I have to be like, man, I need that product. We're solving something here. This is something cool. Or it's on a market trend, whether you're not like, you know, if you're not solving a need, it's more of like what's trending in the market. And it's stuff our customers. So I always look before I launch a product is one, how easy is our customers going to be able to wrap their mind around this? Because if you're not doing something that is already catering to what guys can understand, you got to spend a ton of marketing and getting people to understand. So I always look for how hard is it going to be for customers to wrap their mind around it? Are we solving something out of this? What's the difference in the product? And when we do those three things, it sells itself. I know I've got something coming that's gonna bite me in the tail. Everybody has, and I just pray that, you know, I use it as a learning experience and I'm mature and it's gonna make me a better businessman. So, but I hadn't had it yet. Not that I, I classify as a catastrophic failure, but, um, but I know it's coming. It's coming, we all, we all have to, to have it. So I'm gonna, I, I'll, I'll come out wiser though. You're still young. Mm -hmm. You got a long way to go. 32. How? 32. 
Is that all? That's it? Okay. Looking ahead, mm -hmm. the old legacy question. You're too young for a legacy question. But down the road, looking back, what, what, do, you, what do you want people to look back on? Not necessarily the brand, but you and catfishing and that whole world. Have you thought about that? What, what kind of... Uh, what kind of impact you're trying to make with this? Yeah. I, you know, I, I guess I haven't really focused on the legacy side of it. I, I hear, you know, it, it, that comes, you know, I'm not far from it. I probably should be, you know, thinking about that. But I don't want it to be about the, it was building a brand and it becoming successful. If it becomes majorly successful, it gets bought out or something like that. I realize more and more each day, and I think this comes along as the older you get, you know, when you see your parents getting older, you experience a family member die, you know, like you start to look at stuff a lot, lot differently, and there's so much more to life than making money, it being successful, it, it really is at the end of the day about relationships, and I guess my legacy is just, you know, I, I want this brand to do good and I want to do good to where my legacy, I don't want it to be through this. I want it to be what I'm going to do with what this brand has done for me, you know. I want to get to that point to where I can then go work on my legacy. But I don't think my legacy will be anything, you know, that I want to be known for in the fishing world. I think if this does well, if it, sales if it don't if we if i remain where i'm at for the next 15 years i'll do something good for people you know and make a legacy well like i promised folks that is a pretty revealing interview with him uh it's one of the things i wanted to get in doing this podcast and doing this video podcast is to peel back those layers of the onion, so to speak, and get down to some of the deeper stuff. And um, I hope you found it interesting. I'd love to get your feedback on um, uh, just what you think about the podcast and the style of the content. If you're trying to get a hold of Caleb Page, catchthefever.com, uh, you can reach out to him there. Uh, if you're interested in their rods or any of the products they sell, they also sell fishing line. Uh, some clothing, uh, a lot of different stuff. And I'm sure down the road you'll be seeing more and more from them. So uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, but until next time, we'll just have to catch you out on the water. Well, folks, if you made it this far, thank you for watching. Here are a couple more videos that I think you're going to like. I'd watch that one and then that one. No, no do, do that one first and then that one. I, I don't know. Just watch them both. They're both good.